uh, professor here in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching and the co-director of the National Center for Restructuring Education, Schools, and Teaching. And I'm really delighted to uh, have uh, some time to spend with a number of colleagues um, from Finland and others here at the college, including uh, myself, have had opportunities to, to visit uh, in Finland, learn a little bit about um, the systems there, and begin to develop um, some relationships uh, which we're looking forward to uh, building on and extending today. Uh, I just want to um, briefly uh, welcome all of you and uh, introduce in a minute Danny Friedrich, who will moderate the session, but also uh, welcome Yari Lavanen, who will have a few comments right yes, now. Yes, that's the few. So I'm Yari Lavanen, the head of the Department of Teach Education, Helsinki University. So I'm so glad to have this possibility to be here on the behalf of our, our team, so we, we are very much looking for, for this meeting and, and, the, and the discussions we will have today. There will be all together five people from Finland. Jukka, Auli and Lena will have the talks this, this morning, and I and Arto we will have a talk in the afternoon session. So thank you very much for organizing this. We will enjoy, I'm sure, and let's have a nice discussion. Great. Lena is going to start first with um Discussion of student teachers as, research, as researchers. She's going to present for about 10 minutes. And then Auli uh, is going to present on the construction of professional agency during teacher education for 15 minutes. And we're going to leave them uh, half an hour for discussion. And then we're going to move on to the second part of the session. Mm -hmm. As you can see, um, what Dan just uh, said. So we are going to, I'm talking a few words, maybe 10 minutes, about the structure of Finnish teacher education, the principles and organizing themes, how we have organized our teacher education, and then Auli will continue and talk about the processes of uh, student teachers' ages. And after that, we discuss, ask uh, questions, answer questions, and um, Jukka will continue after that. He has very interesting research case studies and uh, findings about our teacher education. And after lunch, uh, Tom will moderate. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Arto will uh, talk about the principles and structures of our educational system first, very shortly. And then Yari will continue with the assessment uh, uh, structures and processes in various, various levels. Okay, so I'll start. Um, in Finland, our teacher education um, has been academic university-based education for all teachers since 74 and 79. We studied master's level degree for all student, uh, all uh, teacher categories, including class teachers. And uh, 95 kindergarten teachers uh, joined our academic uh, society, and we. Kindergarten teachers also do have a um, BA, uh, BA uh, degree in Finland. Our teacher education has three cycles, uh, BA, MA, and uh, PhD uh, degrees. And uh, the part of our teacher education, the first two cycles, are... Uh, it's okay, it's okay. Are, um, giving the, the qualification for teacher education. And that's, that's something that is different compared to your teacher education here. Uh, universities can decide about the qualification. Also, one uh, point I want to make uh, is this, uh, that all teachers, when they start their studies at the University of Helsinki, they come uh, uh, the first year, they, they do their uh, bachelor's in three years, and then continue master's to two years. So the five-year study program. Is, is the basis of, of uh, our teacher education. And we have um, started, uh, I, I would say, around 70s. We started to develop our teacher education so that we have a research-based orientation. And for us, I know that in, in the world it means many, many things, but for us it means four things, basically. Teacher education is considered as higher education throughout the, the, our national system. Teaching and learning is based on research, 
teacher educators conduct research and they teach what they research. Teacher students learn research skills as well as conduct research projects while integrating theory and practice in their, in their learning. And actually, the integration of theory and practice uh, is uh, a continuum from the beginning of the studies to the end of the studies. So, <clears throat> these three things are the main organizing themes we have chosen to our teacher education program. Firstly, research-based approach. Theory-practic re relation, it's very uh, strong and important part of the teacher education, the organization of, of our, our program. And the aim and the, the method we use is to develop pedagogical thinking and agency of our students. We do have a vision. <laughs> And that means that teacher education is a very important part of our uh, society and the development of our, our society and the well-being in Finland. And for that, we organize uh, our, uh, our interaction and uh, we appreciate very much a collegial uh, working culture. It means that this working culture uh, uh, provides knowledge co-creation, students are active part of the, of the uh, interaction. We uh, um, appreciate active pedagogical argumentation. We can have uh, <coughs> different kinds of, uh, of uh, opinions, but we want to dis discuss, justificate and make decisions very openly. So we do not have to uh, uh, agree in all uh, situations and all uh, uh, about all things. So, uh, as you all know, we have different kinds, lots and lots of different kinds of models of teacher education, and this uh, uh, gives one possibility to organize these uh, programs. If pedagogical thinking is intuitive and the model of structuring the action is inductive, we are talking about experiential or personal or orientation to teacher, teacher, uh, teacher's profession. School-based orientation, uh, we think that it's intuitive but deductive. So the school gives the rules and the, the uh, content to the uh, teacher education. Uh, induct inductive and rational, we talk about problem-based case approach to teacher education. And we think that when teacher education is organized like deductive, uh, academic, university-based, and rational uh, pedagogical thinking is, the, is, is used, so we talk about research-based. And for us, it means something that concerns about practicing. Well, I have that one here. <coughs> okay, so um, uh, our teacher education has a twofold approach to practicing. Practicing the theory practice relation is not only practicing teaching, like we very often think that it's this practicing teaching. But we think uh, the twofoldness in our, uh, our program means that practicing also means practicing research. And students start from the basic level. When talking about teaching, they start, uh, you know, their, their uh, teaching includes everyday thinking, memories of, uh, of their school time and their teachers, firstly. Then there comes receipt tips, routines. After that, maybe skill-based teaching. And But we think that this basic level is not enough. And that's why we have this uh, research-based orientation and we have this, um, this uh, five-year uh, study program. 
organized, as I said. Because we really think that the uh, basic level, the teacher education needs to go to the general level. And uh, it means that uh, practicing teaching has the goal and aim of, of developing student teachers' personal practical theories of education and, and teaching, and their pedagogical thinking and reflection. And when we are talking about, about practicing research, in the basic level, <coughs> in the beginning, we would say it's about knowledge-based adaption, consuming research, action research. And when we go back, uh, over uh, to the general level, to the master's level, important things are producing research and also evidence-based research skills. So, do we need inquiry-oriented teachers? When we have this kind of a teacher education program and uh, organizing themes and principles, we still uh, educate teachers to schools for kids. <coughs> and uh, our aim in this uh, research-based orientation is not to produce uh, researchers. Of course, very often, students come back to university and do their PhDs. But the uh, aim is to educate uh, inquiry-oriented teachers. <coughs> teachers are actively involved in curriculum development and uh, uh, evaluation processes in Finland. That's why we need uh, uh, inquiry-oriented teachers. They have lots of uh, power and uh, and, uh, you know, to really uh, develop curriculums by themselves. They need these skills. And also, school is no longer a static workplace. Nowadays, schools open to the, to the uh, society. Future teachers need dynamic competencies. And actually, what I think is a very important thing is that uh, teachers, uh, they work multi-professionally. They have lots of different professionals with whom they work. And for me, that's my opinion, uh, is that teachers need to be the leaders of this uh, multi-professional uh, uh, collaboration. And that's why research-based approach, approach is seen clearly relevant to teachers' work in Finland. Okay. I will continue now. Uh, that was uh, my talk was about the structures, and now I will continue with the processes, construct, constructing uh, of professional agency during the year. Lena presented our program and main ideas uh, of teacher education and, and the structures and principles, and I will more continue to the. Uh, uh, topic, of, uh, topic of professional agency and learning of professional agency during teacher education. Uh, we have a... Uh, the structure of my presentation is here. Uh, first, some orientating words to the Finnish uh, educational situation right now. Then some words about the theoretical framework uh, of this presentation related to agent agency, how to become and stay as an agented teacher in Finnish system. Uh, and then I also present our uh, just launched um, research project funded by the Academy of Finland. Uh, it has started just uh, in this uh, fall and will end at uh, 2016. Uh, and then some words uh, about the various contexts of agentic Finnish uh, student teachers or teacher, uh, teachers, some reflections related to Finnish situation right now, and then con conclusions and considerations. As you all may know, uh, there is a really wide uh, international interest focusing on uh, Finnish educational system in its wholeness. PISA results was the main reason and we were to totally really surprised about the queries and questions and comments uh, coming from uh, various countries. Uh, 
Um, people were asking me about the secrets of a Finnish comprehensive school and also the specific characteristics of our teacher education. And I know that I shouldn't say this, but I still do, <laughs> because we don't know the answers. <laughs> Only cl uh, clear, uh, clear answers to these, to these things and to the uh, the, to the success of our pupils in PISA studies. We have only very good questions and possible answers, but we don't know, we don't know the exact uh, reasons why this has happened. Uh, the thing that we know that, uh, that although the situation is quite good in Finland, uh, we have also uh, in some indications that our teachers feel that the goals and contents of our national core curriculum are quite demanding at schools. Uh, pupils' welfare and educational equity is the thing that uh, our teachers and educational researchers discuss uh, at the moment. We have also pupils with needs of special education, more and more of them all the time. And also the multicultural issues uh, are the things that our teachers and also student teachers think about. The multiculturalism is quite new thing in uh, Finnish society and if we compare it to your, to your situation it's totally, totally different. So we are learning uh, and especially in teacher education we are learning that what it actually is that w and how we should educate our student teachers to become uh, professional agents in their own, own school context when they go, go to work. So uh, I have bolded the main thing there, that what is the impact of our uh, teacher education on student-teacher learning and pupils learning at schools when they go there. We have some research results on that, but not, not so much. And we are really interested on that because we as teacher educators are really willing to um, educate competence, competent teachers to, to our schools and we ha really have to follow follow the things that uh, come and go uh, uh, at school level and that should be taken into account in teacher education. So as you may know, uh, the concept of agency and teacher ag agency has been suggested as a key characteristics and for, for teachers to work in various, various professional settings and uh, it has been suggested as a capacity to guarantee uh, the responsible action in, with, with pupils at school. There are a lot of theories related to agency in uh, sociology, in psychology, and also sociocultural theories. And we have also some theori theorizations uh, in teaching, teacher context, but not so much empirical evidence of learning learning of agency, uh, what, it, what it actually means and what, what it actually, uh, how it actually happens. We, we know that uh, being an active professional agent means that a teacher perceives herself or himself as an intentional expert of pedagogy, making decisions and reflecting on the impact of her or his actions, and, uh, and, and he is the person who uses her or his capacity uh, to enhance the learning of pupils and also enhancing the, uh, the learning of uh, colleagues. Um, interesting thing uh, about the in uh, teachers' professional agency is that it is, it is not a fixed characteristic or fixed thing, but it is rather quite, quite relational and interactional uh, thing that happens between between a uh, individual and the context where he or she is working, and it is embedded in professional context at schools, but uh, it is also embedded uh, in the learning context during teacher education. So we as teacher educators uh, should provide this kind of opportunities to learn, learn to become and learn to be agent during, already during in teacher education in order to guarantee this kind of uh, uh, things uh, to happen in professional contexts at schools. So the basic uh, characteristics of teacher agency require 
that it should be supported already during teacher education. So it, uh, it should, it, so it would go to the real practices on school level and community level and these kind of things. So uh, then we come to the pedagogical practices of teacher education, which uh, should uh, uh, provide <coughs> adequate opportunities for student teachers to actively participate and in, engage in their learning processes and teaching and learning uh, practices. And teacher education should also offer an arena for student teachers to, to carry out this kind of active way, way of doing things and, and uh, to, to influence their own, own learning process. As I mentioned already, the challenges and the possibilities have been identified, identified in theoretical literature and also already in some empirical works. But there are, we have made a review for our research project and actually found only uh, about uh, 35 empirical articles uh, which focus on the learning of professional agency during teacher education. So student-teacher learning in teacher education in relation to uh, professional agency. So it is a really emerging thing in teacher education research but not so not so em empirically uh, tested or identified or, uh, or proved yet. Uh, the uh, research project that I mentioned uh, uh, is described here. So we are four researchers uh, on associate professor level who do, do this at the University of Helsinki. Kirsi Puhelt, my colleague there, and I, and Janne Pietarinen at University of Eastern Finland, and Tiina Soini at University of Tampere. Uh, it is in the middle, middle <laughs> of Finland. We are located there in the south, and Tiina in the middle, and Janne in the eastern part. And the uh, research project focuses on this learning, learning of professional agency uh, during, uh, during teacher education, during the induction phase, uh, when student teachers go to work as teachers and, and the professional teachers who have worked for quite a long time uh, in teachers' work. It is a multi-method, a longitudinal study. We collect a survey data, a video, videos from teacher education, from uh, this induction phase, and also from pro professional teachers, and collect, all, of course, interviews and various, various kinds of qualitative data in order to map, map this learning, learning of professional agency. We have uh, three teacher cohorts. Uh, they were the, those cohorts that I mentioned. First year student teachers, when they enter to our teacher education programs, then the teachers at induction phase, at the end of their studies, and going, going to, uh, to work as teachers, and then, then these, these experienced professional teachers. And we think that the benefits of this kind of uh, research project is uh, that it, it produces research results on teacher learning, and its regulators in various contexts, and uh, teachers' professional phases, um, and help, it helps to identify the learning patterns of uh, professional agency. And also some results about the impact of teacher education. Um, we don't, as I mentioned in the beginning, we know, we know some, some things, but uh, this is the one thing that we don't know yet very well. And the reason why this is uh, uh, especially interesting that uh, for us to, to, to do research on this thing is that uh, maybe you have heard that Finnish teachers have uh, lots of freedom and lots of responsibilities when they go to work as teachers. So Lena mentioned this master level teacher education, so it is to guarantee that uh, student teachers learn these agentic uh, capabilities. They have lots of autonomy uh, to make decisions in their classroom on, and even on school level. And uh, they, they are also uh, uh, experts in classroom following the basic principles of uh, national core curriculum and making the curriculum uh, uh, for the school where they work. 
So these are the things in Finnish context where the, uh, where the specific kind of a professional agency is needed. And we are really interested in that how, how our teacher education can, can uh, offer tools and uh, help uh, student teachers to learn capabilities and skills and knowledge to, to meet these, these requirements that are, uh, uh, that are set in our, our context. You have also heard <laughs> these qualities related to, uh, to a Finnish educational system or, or the climate, climate uh, in Finland related to matters of education, uh, democratic and consensus-seeking ethos of decision-making in educational policy, respect for learning and education, and trust in education on various levels uh, to teachers, as professionals, trust between uh, pupils and teachers, and trust as a general uh, precondition for cooperation. So our aim, in big aim in Finland, to try to to somehow uh, keep the situation like this, so that we could educate teachers uh, to work in a meaningful way and to uh, to keep the situation <laughs> like this. Uh, uh, trust trustful and democratic also in the future. I'm, I'm curious, um, if you don't, if teachers have all this autonomy and you don't evaluate teachers, how do you evaluate the results of the research project that you just described? How will you know at the end whether it's better or the same or worse? Or what is the aim? What do you trying to get to with your research project. So that how, how we know that uh, the things that are done in teacher education are relevant. Are improving education or not improving it. It's a research project. Mm, yes, we know um, <laughs> we know it on we may know it on, on teacher level, but not not maybe uh, in pupils learning. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> that part we don't have um, there but uh, from teachers part and from their experiences uh, uh, during teacher education and when they go to work and when they continue their work at schools, that they, based on their experiences, that how relevant teacher education has been in relation to the challenges and the tasks mm -hmm. and the requirements that are set for them uh, at school. And that is the thing that we know, not uh, the impact to, uh, to pupil learning, that, we, that should be or could be the next Step. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that is also the question that we always uh, <laughs> get, especially in in international context. And it is uh, we have realized that it is more more hot topic uh, internationally than than in Finland. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, as a side note, I wish we would ask lawyers what the effect on justice in society is as often as we ask teacher ed is what our effect on pupil learning is. <laughs> um, but uh, in terms of professional, uh, the, the, the focus on the learning of professional agency in teacher education, you must have some uh, working understandings and theories and uh, hypotheses and practice as to how that happens. Could, would, would you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, we know uh, from the pra uh, some <laughs> some hints or notions that, uh, for example, the pedagogy that makes the participation possible, that makes the problem solving, uh, learning and problem solving possible, and taking an active role in in the teacher education courses and uh, an active role in one's own learning process during teacher education. In, those are the indications that uh, those should be. Um, should be em emphasized in order to guarantee this kind of qualities to happen, to transfer to professional context. Because we know that people learn what they do. So <laughs> if they sit sit down and write papers, they don't learn to sit sit on one place and write papers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if they have an active role and they have a uh, responsibility to do something to to enhance their own learning to um, suggest things for 
uh, for others and for teacher educators. So they also learn to do that. And we, uh, as teacher educators, are in the position when we organize organize the courses of teacher education. So we we have to do it because we have the uh, the first authority to organize it. So it is very much uh, required from students' part if uh, so to come to us and say that please could we do this in this way or that way. But it is uh, I think that it's our our task to do in teacher education. And one uh, thing uh, I think is important is that we uh, teachers uh, who study in our department, uh, the major in education, but we started in uh, 96, we started, they, they have a possibility also to major in, in uh, educational psychology. So those are from 90, uh, the major in educational psychology, uh, they started in 96, I think, uh, they have had different kinds of methods in, in teaching and instruction and learning. And we know about that, that the processes, uh, student teachers uh, go to uh, work together and the processes they have uh, uh, done uh, during their teacher education. Uh, we know that there, there happens different kinds of things uh, compared to traditional methods. And one important thing is that they always work together as teams mm -hmm. and, uh, and they share the learning process <coughs> together. And we are in a uh, situation now in our department that we really uh, want and need to uh, implement those uh, methods that work for them. Um, I just have a question about <clears throat> when teachers first experience the classroom environment. I know kind of our model here, a lot of times aspiring teachers get a lot of experience at the college level with classes and methods and things like that, but limited experience in an actual classroom. So I was just kind of curious about how you kind of bring, bring teachers into the classroom environment. Well, um, for I think for all teacher categories, uh, the, it's very important that they, from the beginning, they have experiences from practice. And uh, I know that uh, class teachers uh, start in their first year, in the first period, they go to school. At the same time, they have their theory lessons of uh, didactics and pedagogy. They go to schools to learn about the kids, the, the, the pupils, students how they, what ages there are, and what, how are they, uh, kind of, what happens in classroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that uh, pupil orientation, they then start to study the subjects, the, the pedagogy of the uh, subjects, and then they go next time to the school, school to practice teaching. Mm -hmm. First, they are not practicing teaching, but uh, next uh, step is to practice teaching together with somebody else. They are always doing things in pairs. So they're with an experienced teacher? No, with no, another, 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 another student. Yeah, teacher. but always, you know, the, 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 the experience. Yeah, and the, the practice uh, is always guided. So there is always a class teacher or a subject teacher and a university lecturer uh, mentoring during the, the practicing periods. That is very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, just, I have kind of a follow-up question to the question about your hypotheses about what might produce a sense of professional agency. And I was curious about how you scaffold new teacher learning and teacher preparation about agency. So aside from some of the features of the program that you talked about in terms of you know collaborative work and group work, are there assignments or courses or particular experiences that the student teachers have in the program that really help them you know, specifically learn about agency and develop an understanding? And could you talk a little bit about sort of how you scaffold their learning of professional agency throughout the kind of teacher education program? I think that we don't explicitly use the concept of professional agency, but rather the qualities related to agency, like 
uh, knowing what you are doing, uh, knowing the reasons behind, knowing the various uh, various ways uh, ways of doing things, and uh, like, like um, uh, constructing the uh, professional teacher identity as a part part of professional agency. Uh, I think that it happens uh, through throughout the teacher education, throughout the various courses, various uh, tasks that uh, student teachers do. They can be group work done together, they can be book tests, they can be um, uh, teaching practice periods, they are um, uh, research method courses and uh, writing a thesis. Um, I, I somehow understand that these, all these activities somehow uh, construct the agency of student teachers. Uh, we, we have some data uh, from our stu stu student teachers and according to their experiences there are certain courses that are especially important for them where they, where, where they really test that uh, will I be or could I be a teacher in the future and the practice periods are very important tests for them because then they, then they really face, face the teacher's work they have to plan plan the lessons, discuss together with other student teacher and supervisor, and then then they really meet the pupils, and they have to um, they have to survive at school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it is really challenging for them in the beginning, especially especially for those who don't have any experience to act as a teacher in a te at school in a teacher position. They, they have experiences, as we all have from schools, <laughs> during several years as a pupil, but n not in a uh, teacher position. And one thing also I'd, I'd like to add is that uh, you use uh, that kind of methods uh, where students really plan their own study, their own uh, work. So teacher is not having everything ready when, when the course starts. And teacher uh, gives the uh, uh, planning uh, uh, job to students. They kind of plan their own curriculum, their own tasks. And that's, of course, uh, one uh, way of, of, of being an uh, active agent. Um, I have a couple questions. The, it's about clarifications with the slides and maybe a follow-up question to the research nature. But there was one slide that said um, you see teachers as developers of curriculum. Yeah. And my assumption is there's a national curriculum. But there was one of the follow following slides looked more like the sense of agency came from the enactment of curriculum rather than the development of curriculum. So the extent to which, one, the first question is sort of the extent to which there's an intentionality around the developing of skills as, as curriculum creators or curriculum enactors. So for example, if you went into 10 different schools in the sixth grade in October, would they all be doing more or less the same thing? as a function of the national curriculum. And then the second question is the, so when you're at a university you can teach teachers all these research skills or how to be research based. Um, we tend to say best practice which is almost meaningless in the United States rather than best evidence or research based. But once people are in the schools, how do they access the research literature on the work they're doing? Should we answer to first question first? <laughs> or <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, it was related to curriculum yeah. uh, process. Oh yeah, that, yeah. Uh, what it actually means that teachers are uh, actively constructing the curriculum at schools. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the structure uh, of the steering system of our basic education in Finland at schools. Uh, there is a basic education act which is the first first thing which uh, states these equity and equality mm -hmm. things that we should provide uh, teaching for all, all pupils uh, at all mm -hmm. societal backgrounds and these kind of things. And then uh, after that our council of state uh, uh, 
they uh, decide the general goals and time allocation for our national core curriculum. And then uh, our uh, national board of education uh, makes the, uh, the national core curriculum of basic education for all schools throughout the Finland. And then uh, the responsibility on municipal level is to construct uh, the school, uh, school curriculum based on these general guidelines in the national core curriculum. And uh, we have taken this process into account in our teacher education so that uh, uh, we, have a, we have a course related to curriculum. Elena, you are teaching it at the moment. <laughs> yeah. and, and also in various uh, uh, pedagogy courses, in various subjects, they go through the principles set in the national core curriculum so that when they go to schools to work as teachers, uh, they, they really know that they do it actively. The curriculum work, work actively on a school and municipal and school level. So is, the, is there a comprehensive curriculum for each subject and grade that's printed, published by the ministry that everyone would have in their hands? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Guidelines. For each subject, it's only five pages. It's guidelines. Right. Guides. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is, and it is also important difference. And it is also in English. So if you are interested, you you can. Five for nine years. It's very the core curriculum in in Finland. It's very open in that way that everybody uh, wants and needs and have to do uh, their own curriculum, and they can use their own. Uh, surroundings and environment and, and the possibilities yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, around the school and the, the society where the school is located. Yeah, the specific yeah. local characteristics and strengths and uh, the characteristics are taken into account in the, in local, the local curriculum. curriculum. For example, if in in our in in the school where I was working was uh, was um, in the eastern part of Helsinki area, which is near the sea. And there was a very nice surroundings around, so we had emphasis on science and on biology and these kind of things because the surroundings uh, offers, offered specific resources for emphasizing th these things in our school level curriculum. But I think there are other elements that go into the curriculum design process that you can argue either support it or constrain it. So in the U.S. we traditionally think of, you know, if, if a cur the curriculum is, if we got these new standards and then the curriculum and then people implemented it, it would work. But I think part of the support and the constraint in Finland <laughs> comes from you have these broad guidelines, but then you have this strong teacher education system. You have text, certain textbooks, a limited number in each area. You also have assessments, right, that tools that you can use. So all of these things go into, you know, they provide people the, um, the, the stuff out of which they can develop the curriculum. It's not like the teacher goes into the classroom and says, okay, I've got this five-page guideline. What am I no. going to do? No, <laughs> no. And the second and what was question the second? about research, how do, once people are in schools, if there's a heavy emphasis on research-based practice, how do they access the research once they're not connected to the university anymore? There are various w ways <laughs> to reach. Um, some of our teachers participate quite actively with our development projects uh, that are um, organized in our teacher education departments, focusing, for example, ICT in education or uh, science, uh, pedagogy of science, or this kind of things. This is one, one route. Uh, some of our teachers uh, uh, participate very actively in in-service teacher education, uh, which is organized by various institutions. And also universities. Also universities, yes. And some of them uh, are our PhD students. We have a quite huge number of PhD students, part-time students, who are our teachers, and then they, then they do PhD at the same time. So these are the... But we don't have any systematic way of uh, delivering yeah. research results for our for our teachers. Maybe there maybe are many, many yeah. routes. Maybe one yeah. uh, route is uh, publishing companies. Mm. We have that kind of a publishing companies that really do uh, 
uh, books for teachers, like like teachers college. I I, I learned my uh, when I was a young teacher, when I visited here, I always went to the bookshop, your your bookshop, to buy new interesting uh, books uh, and research uh, uh, books and uh, like that. Yes. Silent from here. Yeah. And we have a quite, uh, the, our teacher union is yes. quite good in doing this kind of thing. So they have a, a book service for teachers and they deliver and information. And also the Board of Education. Yeah, yeah. National Board of Education. Yeah. Yeah, um, so there's a lot of research and it seems that mo the majority of it is really propagated by the teachers both in their learning process and as working professionals later in their career as well. Um, we kind of have, and I, I say we, I mean, America really has like 50 different education systems in each state, right? So, um, but how do you handle uh, conflict between maybe a, a, a new teacher, they're, they're in the classroom, they have this idea for a particular approach to a lesson, uh, how do you handle the conflict of the, the research they want to do and their, their justification for using that versus maybe a, a more experienced teacher who might not agree with that approach? Um, I have my own experiences with how I've seen that handled here, and I'm curious to see how that, that experience is reflected in Finland. Uh, well, um, I think that that kind of things happen in Finland too. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. But um, very often um, I have heard uh, that our students actually, you know, um, they kind of uh, go shopping before they take their first uh, place because schools are different. Mm -hmm. They go to schools and look at the curriculums and look at the profiles of the schools and the, and, cultures. And the cultures and then they may find that kind of a school that's, uh, uh, you know, in the line with their own thinking and their own uh, values. A and it may take time to find that kind of a school. Uh, but any, anyhow, um, in schools, teachers can have also different methods, different kinds of approaches to teaching. They do not have to uh, do things uh, in a certain way or same possible way. And, and the teacher who is responsible for the class is also responsible for the choices he or she makes related to pedagogy, related to uh, uh, teaching and learning materials, related to other other organizing things related to the teaching. And, and assessment also. Yeah, and also assessment. assessment. He is then, assessing what he has been teaching and how. So it's related to the work of the OCSs. Yeah, and teachers are free to collaborate with their colleagues, uh, but they they don't they don't have to do it uh, related to their pedagogical decisions that they make in their own class. Okay. So, somewhat uh, related to that, it, when you were discussing professional agency, you focused mainly on their um, sets of responsibilities in classrooms. Uh, with a little bit of attention to the school level. But is professional agency also about that level of interactions and in the profession more generally and beyond the school within the society? Or is it um, more narrowly conceived? How, how are you dealing with the issue of professional agency as a broader concept of the teacher's role? Uh, we think it as a broader concept. Okay. We, are, we are focusing mainly on the learning process of an individual, <laughs> a student, teacher and teacher within uh, uh, her or his school community and uh, in some, some things related to larger, larger context, context. We understand it as a, as a that it goes beyond uh, her or his classroom and uh, interaction with colleagues, and but the focus is mostly on in the classroom and for, for example, in, in the uh, pre the, the programs that, that you organize, do they get engaged with the profession more generally? Do they spend time interacting with, with the organized uh, teaching profession? Um, uh, 
attending meetings of, of, of the unions, of uh, the, the, the broader political kinds of uh, activities, or is it, again, more of a school focus? I think that uh, most of these kind of things happen when they are in, the, in their final practice period at school, where, where the emphasis is on uh, the wholeness of teachers' work. They do their final practice period in one of our field schools, <coughs> which means that they do not anymore go to the university mm -hmm. teacher training school, but rather a real school uh, uh, operating around the Helsinki area, in Helsinki case. And they attend all the meetings that their supervising teacher has during their teacher, uh, the, the, their practice period, meaning that they, meet, they can meet parents, they go to teacher meetings, and all kinds of these things, not only focusing on the planning mm -hmm. and doing the lessons. Thank you. Yeah, Thank and also in some, some theoretical courses they have this kind of context, content, but in practice, in practice periods. Ali, so you were talking about teacher agency and autonomy and the focus on the individual teacher as she or he develops. And then you said that they don't really collaborate much once they get into they don't encourage collaboration in when they're in service teachers and or there are no structures in place to encourage collaboration and when we were visiting schools in Finland we were struck by the fact that teachers say they don't really collaborate that they shut their doors they're never observed so how does that all get reconciled into understanding practice collaborating with others for sharing ideas re reinforcing and supporting one another deciding how effective a teacher is beyond what his or her student's assessments show. How do we know and why aren't cultures of collaboration more cultivated in for in-service teachers? Yeah, so, um, you know, when, when I... I'm like in the rest of the world, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we were seeing in Shanghai, for example, they visit each other, right. they are required right. to visit each other's classes right. and yeah. download on lessons and do in Japan, and, and, yeah. you know. Uh, when um, I started as a teacher in, at, uh, it was 70s, 77, Gary, about the same time. I think <laughs> so. <laughs> so um, the uh, we had this uh, change in our uh, school system. Uh, the comprehensive school was changing, and uh, uh, at that time, uh, our curriculum, the core uh, national curriculum, was very strict. We did exactly the same things exactly the same time in October. Every sixth grader had the same things going on. And at that, that time, we learned, uh, my um, age uh, uh, people learned to work alone, to work with textbooks, uh, doors closed. And um, that is, has been changing now from uh, that time, 40 years. And still, it takes time to learn new cultures, to work together. And very often in Finland, teachers work alone. Because they have this old culture that we had in the 70s. And changes happen quite slowly. But for example, the curriculum process is the one that where, where teachers work together. They are required to yeah. work together. But it was a big have, change in the 90s. Yeah, 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 it had changed in 1991. Yeah. But still in other, other things, our teachers are not required if they don't want to. <laughs> So we have time for one more question, and then we can continue the, that a bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry for taking the last question. But, um, this is related a bit to the discussion earlier about uh, beginning teachers, experienced teachers, how they reckon, like new generation teachers and old generation teachers, how do they reconcile the differences? Because you mentioned that uh, while they're in pre-service, uh, they work in groups, and I assume that when they leave the universities. They, are, they, they become, they go into separate different schools, they experience some kind of culture shock. Is there any scaffolding in a, or infrastructure that exists in schools that allows for this, these new teachers who are used to working in groups, and now they're seeing their colleagues from older generations who might not necessarily want to work in groups, is there any kind of like um, process that helps them to aid climbing in schools? Like mentoring? Like mentoring, or are there like, um, 
emerging networks that are appearing between schools, like within the same cohort, I work with, uh, I might not necessarily work formally with another school, but I might share my resources with former groupmates yeah. that I had when I was in university. Is there something like that? Uh, we are uh, developing our uh, in-service teacher education at the moment and one of the big issues is this initial uh, teacher education, uh, the first few years in the beginning. And we are planning, we are um, developing a model where teachers, uh, new uh, teachers, could come back to university and, uh, and you know, to keep contact with the uh, their peers from from university, so that's one part of the, the uh, in-service teacher education that uh, is now in process. We need to do something for that, and also in uh, in-service teacher education, um, we want to develop the model uh, to combine the pre-service and in-service teacher education, so that universities have uh, kind of a bigger part in, in that process. Because nowadays uh, in-service teacher education is, is mostly uh, uh, done by teachers unions and uh, municipalities. <coughs> so uh, it has not that kind of uh, organizing uh, uh, structures as pre-service teacher education. And we are doing that at the moment. All right. So, uh, Yuka can okay. we, we present the next paper on pedagogy of teacher education for 15 minutes and then we'll have another block of half an hour to keep the discussion going. I come from the University of Turku, the second largest university in the Finland, and as my Helsinki colleagues uh, always like to remind me, it's the, the second best also. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not. Uh, before I start, uh, and listening to the, my colleagues and your um, discussions, one thing uh, arises, the, the strong and great teacher autonomy that prevails in Finland and seems to um, dominate all the issues that so far have been discussed. Um, and also, now when we are in the house of John Dewey, it's, it's quite a... I'm afraid to mention the word reflection. <laughs> but now when I have done it... <laughs> I have done it. But I think that the concept and the practice of reflection is very important in the Finnish case. Uh, and when we are speaking very much about the research-based teacher education. I think very much we are talking about reflective stance that we are trying to support with our, with our studies. Like everywhere, we try to, of course in teacher education, we try to develop practices that we hope that are effective and are unable teachers to acquire the knowledge and skills that they work, need in their work. And especially in the Finnish case, because we, we mentioned that we are research-based. This is a very difficult and demanding task for us. What does it mean to be research-based? Of course, it's a case of everywhere, the persistent case in education, uh, this theory practice dilemma or division. But I think in Finland we can't escape uh, that dilemma. It's very, very important and ever present to us. How to connect, construct multiple the connections between what we see, what does it mean? and how to make generalizations about it, and how teaching is affected the student learning, and especially here, in this case, in teacher education. 
what we do in teach education, what kind of impact, I don't have any answers, <laughs> don't ask, <laughs> can it have on, the st um, on our student teachers or future teachers? We try to, sorry. we try to move from, when we educate teachers, we try to move from sort of simplistic exp explanations towards more sophisticated, sophisticated explanation of the actions. That means we must be interested in teacher learning, how it takes place in, in real classrooms where they are practicing, but also during the teacher education courses. That means we are interested in reflection, that word again. But reflection, in a sense, how it can, how it provides uh, user action-oriented knowledge in a new project. So no, not just a reflection for reflection's sake. Not just phrasing it. And always, and also, we are, as I already told, we are very interested in teacher agency. Something has to be done. Something has to happen also in teacher education. I think you are familiar with these, these basic principles, but that's also uh, our sort of guidelines. What we are trying to do, we have to develop descriptions of practice, what is happening. That's quite demanding to find ways to get in touch with the practice. Then we have to try to analyze it, what happens there. Then we have to develop the language with our students, language or practice, the concepts, how to deal and talk with these and understand these issues and in order to evaluate what is going on. I think that's what we're all doing. And here our research base stands we like to see that it goes through all what we are doing. Reflection mm, is such an often used word. And I think that there are many big promises, but quite limited results how so far, how it has to provide teacher learning and teacher education. But I think we, we should not give up. We should develop and test more appropriate tools to promote teachers' competencies. And we see the reflection in Finnish case, in Finnish autonomous teachers, and our whole educational policy relies on this position. And in order to do that, and in teacher education, we need time, and it's a very tough enterprise. It doesn't come up suddenly. We have to be very persistent with this meaning making process, and we need practice in order to understand what is happening there. We know that much of teacher reflection is not very useful. At least uh, many of our students told this also to us. Because very easily we just reinforce the existing beliefs rather than challenge them. And like I said, there is a tendency to believe that reflection has some sort of transformative power. And that, that is a great danger in education. Uh, that it being reflective is some sort of methodological virtue or some super insight it gives us to the educational phenomena. But it does not. And it doesn't come naturally 
and therefore we need the guidance. And I think, um, after listening to your comments and discussions, I think the whole um, teacher education system in Finland uh, tries to um, prevail that sort of a guidance, research-based guidance. In the reflecting what is going on in schools and in classrooms. Just one example with my colleagues and how we, we have worked. We have developed the procedure of guided reflection. We are doing the, I'm afraid of saying here, the QEM framework. We are, we are interested in what people's intentions are, what they are aiming at, what is going on in interaction, what is happening there. It takes time we, to investigate it. And there are some practical elements. We use critical incidents, stimulated re recall, and reflective discussions and portfolios. I think this is quite formal and normal <laughs> to many places. Just to show with this how we work. There are teaching lessons like everywhere. Something happens in classrooms. We are videotaping the lessons. And there are incidents, of course. There are a lot of incidents that are happening. A great many things. We can choose uh, either students student teachers or the, the teachers, the teacher educators can choose uh, incidents that we are sticking to, that we are trying to open up. What is happening here? And there we will first stimulate recall interview in this first first phase, what happened, why, and so on. And all these can be and should be uh, researched. The guidance, how we guide these processes of teachers and um, students' uh, analysis of their work should be guided by our research stance. First we do stimulate recall then we did, after that, reflected discussions, and then they continue with portfolio writings. There are many ways to do this. And our aim and our stance is that we stick very keen to the small things that are important to the students and that are important from the point of view of educators, and we try to get the most of out it. I think I'll I promise to explain, <laughs> to explain the <laughs> results because I have done most of the analysis <laughs> in the collaboration. So uh, we have uh, two slides uh, which describe the uh, results that we have got from uh, the procedure of guided reflection when we have used it in the supervision of our student, student teachers during the final teaching practice. And here you can see uh, that we have done uh, the analysis from all the data sets that we have collected uh, with, from the procedure, stimulated recall interview, reflective discussion and portfolios. And we have uh, used the Fuller and Bounds and Conway and Clark's uh, theories uh, to analyze analyze the, the data. Uh, there are three main categories, uh, self-related reflection, task-related reflection, and impact-related reflection. And it was very interesting to see uh, that uh, the amount of self-related reflection is uh, always the highest during the procedure. But then uh, the task, to the task of teaching and pedagogical things, the task related for uh, reflection, uh, the amount of that is growing all the time du during the guidance. 
and even most importantly, uh, the amount of impact-related reflection in student teachers and uh, these data sets, it also uh, uh, was growing through uh, during the process. So this was very interesting and uh, for us as researchers and supervisors of the practice because we somehow get some evidence that maybe it is worth supporting the the uh, the uh, in this this kind of guided and very intensive way when student teachers are in teaching practice. And then we also made uh, another kind of analysis. Uh, we focused on the uh, learning strand, strands in their portfolio writings and found four different categories uh, by doing the analysis. It is a long story, I don't <laughs> tell the details of the analysis, but rather only the main categories. So we, we noticed uh, uh, during the analysis that there are uh, uh, strands of, of uh, reflection that are, uh, that are static uh, by their nature and quite inductive. And we named them as description and evaluation of practice. So they just elaborated that what had happened uh, and, and how they felt. Then they also had this kind of deductive ways and uh, static reflections, uh, which we named as description and evaluation of prior knowledge. So they had some, some kind of prior theoretical knowledge that had, had some relevance to practice, and they just uh, thought about that. Then these were more interesting categories for us, learning from prior knowledge or theory. They somehow showed in their... Uh, in their uh, phase of reflection that uh, they really it was a deductive way of uh, thinking and there there was a, there was a dynamic character characteristics in that so that they really uh, had had learned something uh, during during the process and this uh, learning from practice was also dynamic by nature and inductive by its course but still they showed that uh, they really had learned from uh, their practical period, uh, practic practicum period in, in teacher education and learned something new, new uh, uh, during the gui guidance. Yeah, this was a short, short <laughs> Thank you. Um, more detailed things are can be found from the articles. And I hope that uh, with these two examples uh, we'd like to present that how difficult how slow it is to build a reflection <laughs> that ends up as a student teacher's uh, hope, we hope knowledge base that will help her or his in his work. So we're, we're very sorry that we are <laughs> not offering any better results <laughs> with our. Magnificent teacher education system. <laughs> oh, we skip these. They are just cases of another. And we go this. Related to the uh, those two studies that are, that are sort of a starting point for our project that has just started at the beginning of this month. It is European Union funded development research project supporting student teachers' action oriented knowledge. That is um, partly based on our work, and now we have very many prominent <coughs> European colleagues that we are working with. And what we are doing. We like to know what knowledge students teachers find useful in their teaching. That's that's one of our main main issues, main interests. How do they feel? What is useful for them? And what is useful? How we can help them to further develop? what they need and what they find useful. Because I think uh, a great many things what we do 
unfortunately, are not are not very useful, even in our Finnish system. <laughs> How can we find it? They, these these issues, and here we at, at least we start with our prejudicial reflection and try to develop it, and we have seen very <coughs> um, elaborated systems here in TC with our colleagues yesterday when we discussed, and I think we are very eager to learn from your experiences in order to develop our efforts too. And so we are video recording teacher lessons and developing analyses and we're building video libraries and what we are what we are really aiming at we are trying to develop hopefully also new pedagogies how to educate teachers reflectively and research based and we are working with University of Tartu University of Helsinki University of Turku and we have colleagues from Spain and Utrecht, Netherlands working with us and we start next week in Helsinki <laughs> so just a few words what we are trying to do and how we are trying to approach those high ideals that we are telling you in the system but, but even if Tom told us do not tell that <laughs> we do not know how how our good results come, we do not. So, thank you. I'm uh, assuming that you probably have a big emphasis on self-reflection for the students in, in the upper secondary schools and all of your schools. And I'm wondering if you find the same difficulties in getting your students to reflect as you find in getting your student teachers to reflect. And if so, how you're supporting the students uh, in the upper secondary schools to do a better job? It's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> we, we know. From yeah. Yes. 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 yeah, but um, well, I think that um, it uh, goes both ways, kind of a uh, Top down, bottom up, you know the practices. If uh, teachers are reflective mm -hmm. and if they uh, have learned to to be to be teachers in, in a certain inquiry way, mm -hmm. they use those kinds of approaches to with their students, and then students learn these skills too. But but um, very often, of course, students uh, their agency is very narrow mm -hmm. in upper secondary or, or, or lower uh, grades. They kind of have the roles, <coughs> the dynamics of their role is very narrow. And it, it needs skills, the, te the teachers uh, need skills to broaden the agencies of students. And very often that uh, happens, or possibilities for that, is to broaden the learning environments. It's not only the classroom where you sit in rows, but you go outside the school and give agency to the transformation of the learning environments uh, gives possibilities to broaden the, the agency of, of the students. Because they really uh, uh, they uh, act differently in different uh, 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 environments. And I think that most of the, um, much of this reflection of students at schools happens through our assessment practices that our teachers use. They, they, they don't use only tests at the end of uh, uh, certain periods, but they also use a lot of self-assessment self things. They also put their pupils to set their own goals for their learning, and they discuss at least our younger teachers, or, or modern 
<laughs> not so traditional teachers in our system, they use various kinds of uh, ways to do assessment and peer, peer assessment. So this uh, offers some possibilities for this self-reflection mm -hmm. and what I am doing, why am I am doing it, how should I do this work mm -hmm. or I had a question about the, um, some of the results that you had from the reflection study when you uh, shared those critical incidents with the student teachers and um, had them reflect on them. Did you have any data or any information on whether their actual teaching practice changed as a result of engaging in these kinds of experiences or having a chance to identify critical moments and then reflect on them? So I guess I'm asking really about the impact of ref the reflective opportunity on their actual teaching practice, whether that was something that you had an opportunity to look at or get any data on. Yeah, we have uh, some some hints of that uh, based on the portfolios that they ro uh, wrote uh, at the end of uh, end of their practice period, where we ask them to to give comments about the procedure and also about the experience to be videoed during the teaching practice and and. Um, about the, uh, the discussions, the interviews that we had after the videoed lesson. And uh, all of them said that it was quite exciting first, uh, but uh, they also felt it useful because they had to look at their uh, teaching from an outsider perspective uh, after they had taught the lesson and um, discuss about it in very analytical way so that uh, we watched uh, the whole lesson with the student teacher together, uh, sat, sat down together and uh, went through the lesson and, and discussed about the events that happened there. Most of the, uh, the notions that we, they made were related to their uh, way of being in the classroom. They were quite, quite critical towards them, themselves. Like, why am I doing this? And why am I doing that? And it was eye-opening experience for them in many, many different ways. And also when we asked them to reflect the episode, uh, one episode that they chose uh, for a more thorough discussion. So it, it had to be related to their own aims that they had set, set for uh, their teaching practice period. They chose this kind of, for example, one of uh, our students had that, uh, the aim uh, to learn to use uh, the learning materials in a more effective and more meaningful way during the mathematics lesson. So there was an episode when this didn't happen quite well, and then we had a very, very interesting and versatile discussion about that. What actually happened and where, where? Um, uh, should be something different be done during the uh, course of the lessons, uh, lesson, lesson with the pupils. And, and she said that she learned from the watching of the video. But we have not followed them when he, they have gone to work, that what they actually remember from the reflection on this procedure, but it could be, uh, it could be very interesting and could be useful to do because I am sure that they remember. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, building on that question, it's fascinating to hear about the centrality of reflection um, in the teacher preparation phase and I'm curious um, when the, those doors close and they start teaching as, as full-time teachers, are there systems and structures to support that sort of reflective practice um, throughout their career or is that something that's sort of more in the initial stages? Again, I think that in our uh, school system, not so many uh, official uh, systems to do this. But it is, it is possible for teachers if they want to. And I know that we have some teachers who this, this kind of, so that they want to develop uh, professionally. And they video, video record their lessons and watch uh, them to, or, uh, alone or together with, with some colleague. Uh, who is close, close for them. Or they ask colleagues to come to their classroom that, and to see that, and what do you think about this? And what do you think about this pupil? And how, how should I act with her or him in order to be more successful? I know that some teachers do these kind of things. 
but there isn't time built into the schedule for that or a system of sorts. No, not any okay. specific time. Can I give a comment? Mm -hmm. So what, what Ali mentioned about that situations where, where teachers are assessing for example, in the case they are using summative assets and they get the results. And in my, my presentation, there's evidence that, uh, based on the interview of many teachers, that quite often they are looking at their students' learning outcomes and, and thinking what they have done, mm -hmm. where they have had success. So it's a, this type of situations are quite typical where they are making reflection, where they have success, what they should be next time. And how and often would that take place throughout the year? So, if, if one course or, or one period is about 20, uh, 38 lesson or 25 lesson, and typically so after this kind of mm -hmm. period, they, they have needs school subjects. Mm -hmm. My data is mainly from lower secondary and upper secondary. I don't know, the primary, the primary teachers are better than that. <laughs> and I, I'm quite sure. <laughs> Just to follow up on that, I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about professional development in Finland and the structures for it, because you talked, I know this was to focus on teacher education, but my understanding, talking to colleagues who worked on professional development in Finland, in comparison to what we think of as professional development in the States, there's very little in Finland, which is shocking, right, mm -hmm. because we talk about that's really what's so essential. But it's, I mean, you have this very powerful teacher education system, but it really pretty much is now you're let out into the schools and you can do these things, mm -hmm. but it's because not for the most time people expect it. I mean, people run their own schedules, right? I mean, they can, they can or they can choose not to participate in professional development. They can go home at noon if their, if their classes are done. Mm -hmm. right. So can you say a little bit more about, is there formal <laughs> professional <laughs> development at all? <laughs> Well, um, um, uh, every um, municipality, uh, they, they have a certain amount of uh, in-service in teacher education and teachers need to uh, participate uh, during one um, academic year to certain amount of that. But it's very, very little. Is it uh, two days or Jesus. something? Three. I, I suppose it's three days. Maybe three days in, in an uh, academic year. And they can choose where they want to go, what kind of a course if they want to take, what they would like to uh, develop in their own teaching. But also, because of the in-service teacher education, the development of professional development, uh, is not organized in, in a, I would say, in the best way. The, the courses are very short and they are distributed very widely. So there is no kind of a, um, how to systematic way. Systematic way. way. <laughs> so it's kind of a palette. You can choose whatever you want. So it may not be that effective in our system. And it's not much that they need to do. And if you are not motivated, you just go there and do something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I have to, yeah I have to say that our teachers attend quite a lot yes. uh, during during various uh, to various kind of courses during for example during the summertime. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and many true. of our colleagues actually organize these. Yes. For example, related to pedagogy of new things in the pedagogy of mathematics <coughs> and new uh, possibilities in music education. Yeah. Many and often university courses. gives these courses at some time. And, it's and even uh, teacher union yes. gives and yes. uh, specific uh, uh, subject teacher unions, yes. Yes. like mathematics teacher union yeah. organize very much these this kind of things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't want to take more than my share. Um, so I, a question, or maybe two questions and comments about the learning in reflection and possibly related to the, to, related to the question of agency and how agency is learned. And I'm sorry if this has already been established, but it, it seems so important uh, to me that I'm going to ask it in case it hasn't yet been established. So as I, as I, as I read um, Dewey and like how we think, he argues 
that reflection really only occurs if the thinker experiences a problem. Um, and that it can't be a problem that somebody else attributes to the thinker. The thinker herself has to... Uh, so if, if, if that's right, it sounded to me, I mean, if that reading is correct at least, it sounded to me like perhaps that is the way the critical incident work mm -hmm. is, is how you're mm -hmm. thinking about that. It sounded to me as if the, the, the prospective teacher's identification of the incident that mattered was crucial mm -hmm. to that work. And so. I'm, I was wondering earlier, and I'm wondering again, in terms of the learning of professional agency, about the your thoughts about, is it important for the learner to be able to make consequential decisions and consequential mistakes? How much, how much does the action have to matter? If deciding and acting is part of, if it's part of what agency is, is there some logic to that? That, that the actions that the learner takes have to actually have real consequences in some way. Is that part of the construction of agency as you see it, or is that not part of it, and does that lead you to have something else to say about how you see it? I'm just wondering how these reflection in and for action, the learning of agency, and the consequentiality of decisions that beginners make, if there are connections among those if that constitutes a question. <laughs> I apologize. If it does not constitute a question, that's on me. Please move on. <laughs> or identify another problem. Or identify another, <laughs> another one. That's, that's, that's good. Yeah. 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 That's a problem so. with the Dewey. <laughs> <laughs> It's very important that you can uh, also uh, uh, fail. Yes. 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 In, I think in pre-service teacher education, you know, in these uh, 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 teaching practice uh, uh, periods and uh, practicing uh, these uh, lessons uh, when students uh, plan and, and uh, instruct, if they do not have this possibility to fail, they, I think, they uh, do not uh, have possibility to reflect and uh, uh, kind of uh, go on with, with uh, the. And I, I would, and many of my colleagues may disagree with me vehemently, but I would, I would, I would suggest that in in the U.S. we're we're really quite frightened of beginners or anybody else for that matter failing, but we really are not interested. We really shy away from letting beginners fail, yeah. um, not out of concern for their tender sensibilities, but out of, out of concern for the argument, well, you wouldn't let somebody who hadn't been taught well do heart surgery, so why would you let somebody teach if you didn't kind of know that they were going to be able to make everything work anyway? Others may say that's not a problem in our system. I don't know. <laughs> I've had more than my turn. <laughs> Uh, I find some information about this in-service training. So, according to recent national level monitoring, based on the representative sample of teachers, uh, about 66% of the physics and chemistry teachers and 67 of biology and geography teachers has participated in in-service training during the last three weeks, the last, last three years, in, in addition to yeah. those they have to take. Yeah. And typically the municipality has paid in half of the situation, and in, in 30 percent, the training has been free. It organized by the National Board of Education, and uh, about 15 percent have paid themselves the training. So I think it's quite good. 66 during the last three years, or for uh, one week or something like yes. that. Kind of a, to add. Those, uh, and, and knowledge yeah. or, or in the discipline also. Yeah. I don't know that this is a question. I guess the question is, what do you think of this? It's more of a comment. But um, I was thinking that a big part of your approach that maybe you haven't stated explicitly, but certainly is throughout this, is 
you're establishing professional norms or work habits around reflection, collaboration, and evidence base that all of the work, these and probably a handful of other things, are at the center of all these things. So that by the time someone's out and sent out into the world, you hope that really what you're impacting is how they think and what they do and the relationship between those things, but you're establishing norms of thinking and behavior. In, in this, most of my work life, I've been in schools the last three years I've been here at Teachers College, but those norms don't hold in schools in the United States, reflection, collaboration, or use of evidence. And maybe the norms that are actually in practice in schools here don't align with the norm, professional norms that we would hope to promote here at Teachers College either. But I'm wondering sort of about that relationship because so much of mm, practice and education is disconnected in this country. And do those norms, other people might want to comment on this, but the, so you might not need as much <coughs> Profession, I was, what triggered it is maybe you don't need as much professional development because here, sort of the prof people's professional lives, they go to work and then when I get out of school and I can go to professional development, I can revisit my professional life or those norms. But there's this big disconnect between what actually happens in the schools and what we would hope and educate people to be happening in their practice. Well, I think well, one thing we need to remember when we're comparing United States and Finland is that we are around 5 million <laughs> our <laughs> inhabitants mm -hmm. so uh, it's so much easier for us to to um, compromise to develop to a certain direction than in this kind of a country you have uh, 200 how many million people three, 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 three. Oh, really <laughs> so um, well, we're a small country compared to China. So, <laughs> on the other hand, member states are about equal. To yes, yeah. 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 exactly. They have it's independence, true. so it mm -hmm. would be compared yeah. to one mm -hmm. member state. In that level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that those kind of comparisons are very tricky because, in, in a way, what is difficult is to compare the whole context. Right, so you have, you're talking about strong unions, you're talking about uh, a system in which there's an autonomy to teachers in the classroom, you're, you're talking about um, teachers that are taught to do research within their, as, as an integral part of a teacher education, but also what is beyond that school, so that role of teachers as almost public intellectuals, as, as, as people that are involved in the world in a different way, there's a different role for the private, private sector. So. While I think it's very important that we do these meetings that we learn from each other, simple comparisons are very difficult to make. Yeah, I just want to be clear, I wasn't no, 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 making no. comparisons. <laughs> because I think I mean, we could go on for a long time about the context and social factors and the distinctions which really don't allow comparisons to be made. But a lesson, so it seems like it's worth considering, is the degree to which Finland has been successful at professionalizing teaching and establishing norms that hold when people practice. Well, it, it, it's a, but establishing is an interesting question, right? So, uh, w you know, w when did this happen? Where did these come from? Did it build on? I mean, you know, to. Can you, can you ever create something out of nothing, right? What was there previously that allowed these things um, to but happen? change the professional norms from the time that Lena was saying mm -hmm. she started yeah. teaching to what exists today. How did that, I don't know that there's a comparison or what the lesson is, but there's been a change, right? It happened somehow. 
And I think that's what's really interesting to try and explore, and it's very hard to get back at that. But I guess I was really struck by the notion that we're starting and we're talking about professional agency. And I think when we talk about it, that in this country, we think of that as an individual characteristic. And Aoli started by immediately talking about it as an interactional characteristic, right? As a characteristic even within a particular like organizational context, but I think you could, we're also, in a sense, you could also make the argument that it's a system characteristic, mm -hmm. um, and it's supported by high quality materials, assessments, right? You need those assessments, you need those guidelines that, you know, just as Danny is saying, it's the whole system that, that really matters. But when we kind of draw out of it, we think about, okay, all right, so Finland, they respect their teachers and their, you know, they, they support it. And part of that is they give them this professional agency, so we can do that. We'll just get the, the brightest people, right? We'll pay them a lot, which is really not that much in comparison to the people we really respect, who are those CEOs and all those other people, right, who make millions more than teachers do, which is not the case in Finland, right? So if we talked about paying people more, in this country commensurate with what it would take, you'd have to pay them to have a similar quality of life of the people at the professions who are making the top, you know, the, the largest amounts of money. So we really have a very individualistic notion even of what agency would mean, and we'd have to transform that in terms of, you know, trying to think about making those um, those comparisons. But try, that, that notion of sort of for me, that's part of what makes the Finnish example so interesting, is that it, it really doesn't seem to have always been this way, right? And even if it's only going back 40 years or 30 years, that's still a pretty interesting change. Um, and, you know, again, it's also, it's, it's maybe it's five, a country of five million, but the fact that there's only, what is it, eight teacher education institutions, period, for those five million uh, folks, so when we're listening to you talk about teacher education in Finland, um, it may not represent all of Finnish teacher education, but it is a reflection of a significant proportion where it would be almost impossible to make that statement about anything in teacher education, even in one state, you know, uh, or New York City, for example. <laughs> um, or one college. Yeah, one college. <laughs> Amy, would you like to talk about this? <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, well, much more you were presenting about uh, these ideas of looking at teacher reflection and sort of what they're reflecting on and how do you evaluate whether or not that's effective and what dynamics of, of um, that reflection process are, are helpful. Um, I'm curious if you ever looked at other disciplines where, reflected, where reflection is very key that aren't teaching, but that use a specifically video reflection. I'm thinking, uh, just from my own experience in, in athletics, athletes and professional athletes, like uh, I was a martial artist, so when you train a fighter, uh, there's a lot of overlap actually between training a fighter and training a teacher. Um, and <laughs> as odd as that may seem, but it, it's a uh, there are very specific uh, processes that a coach or an instructor will go through with, with that athlete in looking at a videotape of their last fight or their last game or their last whatever. Um, and after a while, that, that person then takes it on their own to engage in that practice by themselves without that guidance. But I'm just curious if you've looked at outside industries beyond education for um, suggestions on how to inform educational reflection. No, maybe not, not on that way, but as you said that you can see a lot of things when you look at the videos. So, and that was also the comment from our student teachers, that they would see a lot of things from happening and coming and going in the classroom when, we have, when they have the possibility to see the video. And compared to that when they, when they were there uh, and uh, teaching during the lesson. So, that was similar to, to your point. Yeah. So um, going back to the how question and, and bearing in mind that perhaps there are lessons to be learned for the United States or New York City and perhaps there aren't, but I'm just curious that having lived through that transformation um, as a teacher coming in and then being part of the change, what do you think were the defining characteristics that professionalized um, education in Finland or the teaching profession specifically, um, having experienced it as a person who came in when there was a different system and then who was part of that change? <clears throat> well, um, I think uh, one of the 
the things in Finland is that we have um, uh, the act uh, that uh, kind of uh, specifies uh, our uh, teacher uh, professional uh, the elements that we need to teach in in teacher education programs. So they need to have. It's not we can't not decide by ourselves in our teacher education departments what we are teaching for them, because they they are getting the qualification uh, during their studies or in the end of their studies. So there are certain elements in in all teacher education programs that must be there. The, the, the amount of practice, the amount of um, of uh, uh, major studies and uh, and like that. The amount of research studies, amount of uh, minor subject studies, amount yeah. of the various pedagogical yeah. studies related to subjects taught at school. <coughs> I guess what I'm asking is we read about how there were new laws passed and all of a sudden things changed sort of on a governmental level and perhaps even in terms of the curriculum. But for that to trickle down into the way society um, perceives teachers and the way teachers perceive themselves, that's not something that could be accomplished by legislation. And I'm just curious, it seems that that shift did happen in, in Finnish society and, and yeah. in a short amount of time, relatively speaking. So. There was a strong will to develop uh, teacher education too to put all teacher education to universities in 70s. That was a national uh, will. Everybody wanted to do that. Yeah, and this was preceded by the huge uh, change in our uh, comprehensive school. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, about 40 years ago, yeah. the new system in our basic education started. This uh, same education for all, and not private, no private schools. <laughs> Only a very, very little amount of private schools. And the change, changes in teacher education happened uh, after that. Yeah. yeah. This is the last question. I, I, want, I want to hear a little bit about, if you will, the hidden curriculum of teacher education in Finland. You talked about what you're trying to do in courses, etc. But if I was a student in one of your programs, would I see my faculty engaged in uh, actions that are indicators of professional agency? Is there a lot of collaboration, reflection? Um, I mean, to what extent are your lives um, modeling what you're trying to create uh, in, in, in the teaching profession? And to what extent is, is the university or particularly the, uh, the, te the, the teacher education components of the university structured in a way that that is commonplace, that's part of the, uh, the, the culture of, of those institutions. Um, do, you, do you recognize yourselves in, in the picture you've created or are you struggling to, uh, um, to move in that direction yourselves? Yari, what would you say about that? Because you know <laughs> our department very well. <laughs> Do we share our vision? Uh, we are very. I think we have same some basic aims or vision we are sharing, and it is very much related to the question Karen asked about: Are we teaching agency? Uh, I think we are not teaching agency mm. in our program. What we are sharing there. We are looking for academic professionals who are independent and able to make own decisions, planning, implementing, assessment. We are looking for lifelong learning capacity or this kind of skills. And we think that the research orientation gives you the lifelong learning. And the partnership, Lena mentioned, the partnership, the school is not isolated place. So that's this kind of very big. <laughs> common values we share and, and I think that this is also the uh, environment for, for developing this agency although we are not teaching that yeah. as such yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's we, true yeah and we get told uh, not totally but um, in certain parts we naturally get a different picture of our teacher education when we go to ask uh, from our student teachers, 
I'm sure that re they recognize certain basic things that we have mentioned here, but they also <laughs> have learning um, experiences and thoughts related to our teacher education that we don't know yet. That are uh, then and that can be even opposite uh, to the goals that we have set, of course. <laughs> and from my point of view, uh, I'm uh, the vice dean of the, the faculty, and I can uh, compare our two uh, departments. We have the department of teacher education, and then we have a department of, uh, of behavioral school for behavioral sciences. Yeah, behavioral sciences like. Uh, like psychology and uh, speech. Yeah. Speech. So the the there is a difference when I compare these two departments. Uh, teacher education department is very uh, um, it's more um, more uh, coherent. Sorry. Coherent. Yes. We are looking for yeah. The same direction. Yeah. It has uh, <laughs> same goal, same direction. It's going to to certain direction mm -hmm. and it's coherent uh, compared or, and we do have over 200 uh, teachers there 220 staff members yeah and uh, and uh, the the other department is very um, heterogeneous compared to teacher so maybe maybe there is you know we share some kind of a goal <laughs> and visions but um, we also, we did uh, our study group, we, uh, we had a research or study uh, concerning uh, those, um, we had a, a co cohort of uh, formerly unqualified teachers, working as teachers uh, in our uh, department for, from 2001 till 2006. We took in every year, uh, was it 40? Yes. Mm -hmm. 40 students, formerly unqualified teachers. And what happened when uh, we uh, interviewed them before they started their, their uh, studies, mm -hmm. and then we uh, followed them, what happened and how they, all, how they described what happened in, during teacher education. And uh, they, they really said, I have a few uh, uh, things here. I noticed my teaching started to change. My decisions take uh, in pedagogical aspects. I justify in a new way. And this is what was happening. They noticed the change mm -hmm. in themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, so maybe teacher education really matters, but what and how and what extent it must vary from every student. Mm -hmm. Alright, I would like to thank the speakers, this is a very interesting and engaging event.